afternoon, July 26, 2021, and we're here for the Public Works Finance Committee meeting, and we had Ann Sabala and Art Becky here with us at the table, as well as Gary Wiener, at least for the next couple months. Anyways, so we're gonna start our meeting today, and we have three things on our agenda, and the meeting today is going to end by four. So, <laughs> So let me just say that if uh, we're the first thing we're going to look at is the approval of the July 12th, 2021 Public Works Finance Committee minutes. Anybody have any comments? Look good. No problems. Look good. Let's get rid of number one on the okay, agenda. Okay, we're on it. Nice job there, Taylor. Um, number two, lot division at 2209 Shelby Lane. Thank you, Amy. Um, Amy Hendricks. Share and clicker. I'd like to put this screen over here. <laughs> okay. Just fine. Just fine. It never likes me. Yep, maybe it does. <laughs> Clearly has power. Is the switch on the side of the remote on? Yeah, we did that a couple times. The well, battery could be dead. You want me to call my dear from over here? Yeah, that'd be I fine. Okay. All right. We'll change the batteries next we'll time. We'll just switch on through. Okay. So for your consideration today, we have a lot division for 2209 Shelby Lane. Uh, this property is just uh, south of Joseph, um, accessed currently off of Shelby um, to the uh, just west is uh, El Cajon, the cul-de-sac. The lot currently is tw just over 24,000 square feet. Um, its current zoning is R1. Um, if it were split into two, as today's pro proposal uh, uh, is put forth, each lot would be just over 12,000 square feet. Um, one would be accessed off of Holiday, which is currently um, a, a dead-end street. The other would be accessed off of Shelby Lane. Um, this is in the low-density residential district, R1, with lot, uh, front, or lot widths at a minimum of 80 feet, uh, lot area, a minimum of 9,600 square feet, and flag lots are required to abut a, a right-of-way by 20 feet. And the flag portion of the lot should be no longer than 150 feet. Uh, here is a survey conducted of the subject property showing that uh, flag lot. There was a utility easement, a 20 foot utility easement that runs on the eastern side of that portion of that lot. Um, so uh, because it meets all of the requirements of the zoning, staff has recommended this lot division uh, for approval with no conditions. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Could you go back to the slide that showed the three conditions? Absolutely. Okay, and the flag portion of the lot is how long? The flag portion of the lot, uh, zoning standards and fire safety uh, require that the lot, that, that portion be no longer than 150 feet. Um, as you can see in the survey here, uh, the shorter portion where, where, uh, the, the, where the flag opens up Mm -hmm. um, it is 125 feet okay. until that portion. Thank you. Could you go back to the slide that actually showed where it was being divided and how it was being divided? Absolutely. So basically, you, it extends Holiday Street. Correct. Okay. Yep. That that lot will will abut that right of way, okay. and be accessed at that point. So on the our right side, they will have no access. To get to the Shelby. Correct. Okay. Hmm. Okay. And where is the access for the southern lot? I for the, the southern portion, the lot that's 12,251? Yep. So that access is off of Shelby. It'll be that flag portion. Um, it is 20 feet wide to uh, accommodate fire vehicles and, and a driveway up. Okay. So if it's coming in on that, that's over the top of the utility easement, isn't Correct. it? Mm -hmm. 
is there some kind of agreement with the owner as to if the city has to tear it up to get to the underneath that the owner is responsible for fixing their own driveway? Right, that's something that's handled as, as the development um, is proposed. Uh, engineering will look at that and ensure that there's no portion of the building that's on within that public utility easement. Um, and the driveway itself, I believe there's an a access agreement um, saying if they if they need to access what's underneath to, you know, if there's a, you know. So is there a hold city harmless clause in there that if the city has to dig up a driveway that it's not the city that is on the hook to fix it the way it was, if it was made of decorative brick or something like that? So the city is always responsible for, for surface restoration if we need to access any of our utility easements. So. The utility easement gives us the right to have our underground utilities across the property, but it does, does not deny the owner the ability to use the property or to do any surfacing or landscaping. So if we have a break that we need to do repair, we are always responsible for that surface restoration work to bring it back to the prior condition. And that's standard for all utility easements. Yeah, we usually want to make, well, we want to make sure people don't put buildings on top of it. Uh, we've had some utility easements where we've not allowed people to put plantings on top. Uh, the one I think going up to Vista Tank uh, prevented trees from being planted in the utility easement. I was just curious on how wide that road is because if they actually have to dig up that road because of some problem underneath it where the easement is, I guess my concern is, is does it block the road? And if it blocks the road, where do those people get out? There's no other way to get out except through that road. So the question is, if we have to service utility repair and excavate mm -hmm. it, yeah, they would, their, their access would be limited, just like any other construction project. Sometimes we block roads by uh, excavation of utilities, and they may have to park on the streets. Uh, we, it may be a condition of the contractor to fill it, plate it, to allow access when they're not actively working to that property. But if you're living there and you can't get out, and there's only one exit to get out of there, how do you get out? I mean, so if they're in the middle of doing it, does that mean they get noticed and they have to go park up on the main street, or what do they do? We would coordinate with the owner to ensure that they move their vehicle out to Shelby, park on the street while that repair occurs, and then they could walk in, have limited access during that time, or we'd coordinate with the contractor to ensure that they have to, at the, at the completion of work every day, have to backfill it or plate it to provide access. We run into that condition all the time during construction activities. Okay. If I can ask one more question. So Holiday Street is a public right-of-way, correct? Correct. So there is no cul-de-sac? Fire's fine with it being just butted up against the property? You don't have to do a turnaround unless the length is, the street length is over 150 feet, which that is not. Uh, when Shelby was platted with the Southgate addition, the extension of Holiday was prohibited um, based on the lot layout at that time. So we were, it was known Holiday was not going to extend in the future. Uh, given the fact that this would only access one lot at the end of Holiday, the other lots already come off El Cajon, there would be no need for extension of the roadway, and you really could not construct a cul-de-sac with the existing structures where they are now. Sure. Okay. okay, thank you. Any other questions? No other questions. The easement issue was explained. Okay. Uh, uh, do we approve it? Yes. Okay, and on consent agenda? Okay. I Oh, did you have another one? So I've never, my name's Doug Schumacher. Hey, Doug, walk up there to this thing. Or better yet, come over here to this chair right here. Whichever one you're more comfortable I've with. I've never been to the city of Kansas. Come on up. So either they would just have to get you on the mic. Tell us your name, where you live. Uh, I'm just, just, uh, just to clarify. Just to get you on the microphone. Yeah, my name's Doug Schumacher. I live at 1004 El Collin Street. I've owned that property for about seven years now. So if, it was kind of handy having the map up there, but... Uh, we can pull it we back can up. Put it My back property up. is bordered by three streets. It's a kind of unique piece there. It's by Joseph, El Cajon, and Holiday. And uh, my biggest concern, like I said, is is that if you do this, um, and then you, I, I, I don't so where, really know where what- Where are you located? Is. Let's just get yourself located up there for right me. Here. Yeah, that's my house right there. Okay. 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 And I've lived there for seven years, me and my wife. and. Uh, you know, there's a few things that I, I'm concerned about, but, um, you know, one being if you split this lot that, you know, initially this lot was a Shelby or Cambridge lot or whatever, um, you know, it belonged to the subdivision to the top. You know, El Cajon is a pretty quiet little cul-de-sac street. Um, and 
anytime you add a, a dwelling, you, you can figure there's two to three vehicles per dwelling on average. Um, you know, and my biggest concern is that, and you were questioning that, that access for that second lot that, you know, when I see no conditions when you split it, but then my concern is sometime down the road, is somebody going to come in and ask you, well, can we do this and figure out how to hook that back one to El Cajon and throw another. So then both those lots would eventually access off El Cajon. And that's number one, my concern, um, because I've seen a lot. And I, I come from uh, born and raised in Bozeman, Montana. Been, been in the Palouse for about eight years, and uh, you know anything about Bozeman and change in the last 20 years, um, I've seen a lot of it, and uh, seen a lot of things that get, go through city councils when nobody really pays attention to them, um, and this being one of them, you know, I just, like I said, I bought my property because it was a nice, quiet cul-de-sac street, and neither one of these lots initially like i said it was always it was developed with the upper subdivision you know originally um 1024 the house that is across from me that used to own this lot um you know they uh it used to originally was a holiday address and then they changed it to an El Cajon address and then they were allowed to build within, I think, 12 feet of the city curb. You know, somebody granted them access to do that. And those kind of things I see happen, you know. And um, I just, I'm, I'm concerned, like I said, if you do this with no conditions, that somebody's going to come in here and, because really and truly, you look at the, the, the reality of access there, I mean, to to this other lot that they want to, on the back side, you know. The second one. Yeah. Yeah. It, it give you a and it, space it, it's hard to picture <laughs> unless you're actually there. I mean, in, unless you actually, because there's hillside and stuff, and uh, it's gonna be, it, you know, and then and then the question of 1,024 um, El Cajon, 1,024 El Cajon has been. <laughs> something since I've lived there too. When I moved in, there was uh, six trailers and motorhomes parked around the house. Um, you know, then they sold it. And then in the last two years, we regularly had Moscow PD visiting there monthly mm -hmm. because somebody wanted to chop it up into a multi, they, they, framed in like nine rooms in this house. It's a massive house and uh, and currently it's sitting empty still. So that keeps my concerns going to where is that gonna go if that piece of property and this piece of property and you know, and I'm not, I'm not quite wasting your time here, man. I'm oh, just oh, throwing oh, no, out I'm food for thought. One more thing that happened on El Cajon Street before I moved to there was, I know everybody on the street and uh, they know me and uh um the original house um david and helen that live across from me they built the first house in 1970 and still live there and uh the whole street was r1 mm -hmm. somebody came along in some somewhere from what i understand in in about 2000 or somewhere in there on metal arc street and wanted to build some townhouses. That's one street south of us, a cul-de-sac street south. They wanted to build some townhouses as well. So for whatever reason, I don't even know why you would do it. They changed, and you can see it right there in the blue, they changed the R2 <laughs> clear to half of El Cajon Street too. David, he still hasn't even been able, my neighbor really, you know, he's an elderly gentleman. He hasn't really been able to, con, you know, tell me why they did that, you know, I mean. But know. the good news is, is that you are clearly the neighborhood watchdog, and I think that's a compliment to you. And the issue is they can't make any changes with respect to zoning or, or changes with respect to what is authorized by the code without coming back here. And <coughs> if they do that, you'd clearly get notice. And so the answer there seems to me that, um, 
You just gotta keep being the neighborhood watchdog to see what goes on. But at this point, it's hard to put conditions on it that we don't know. We don't know exactly what those would be. You know, you can't change the zoning code. I mean, that's just, that seems kind of like we can't really do that. We take the issues when they appear in front of us. Okay. <coughs> and also so, relative to uh, the <coughs> southern lot, the uh, 251 square foot one, uh, accessing El Cajon, I don't think that's feasible given the shape of that lot <laughs> because it, it, there isn't enough space to run a tricycle through that pointy end onto El Cajon. That would mean that they would have to work in agreement with whoever owns that chunk further south uh, yeah, to get through. And so I don't see that as a possibility of happening. Without some change. It would have a big change. And then you'd have to get that change, and I think. You know, one another thing, even the the young couple that just went in and built to the the access off that 20-foot mm -hmm. road that goes in to the west, kind of southwest there, mm -hmm. they built in there yep. on R2, a beautiful yep. new R1 home. Yeah, you can see it from <laughs> That Heron. was quite a statement there. You can I think, see it too, from Heron's you know. hideout. It's you quite know. well done. So, um, so we yeah. hope you get that for the next time, the neighbors that you want. Yeah. You know, I just, there's plenty of other places, like I said, from where I come now, they build, you build in, and go R2, R4, you can shake your neighbor's hand through their bedroom windows, um, you know, and I just would hope that's my concern. And there is another thing, too, with my lot, um, that lot that that is going to access off a of holiday, too, mm -hmm. I've sent pictures to this I'm not the neighborhood watchdog either I just oh, I, I like well, I don't mean that as a bad term at all every neighborhood wants somebody to but that on lot drains that. the whole lot drains onto my lot I can mm. I have video pictures mm -hmm. of it draining because it's just all natural at this point and it misses there's curb and asphalt up to the property line um, on holiday uh -huh. and sidewalk. My house is only one has a sidewalk and curb all the way around there too. But uh, um, you know, the water comes down and goes this side of the sidewalk and through my yard and rivers down. You know, and I would hope that if you do grant somebody to access, that is that a condition that he would establish some kind of curb and gutter right into his property to so when you know, that comes up you come back to visit us i think it's okay? part of the code already that one you have to establish the street frontage there and two you can't be letting runoff from your property go off onto somebody else's so that's i'm pretty sure they'll save me so they'll have to uh, collect and convey their stormwater to uh, whatever is the receiving stormwater system that we have in that area. Um, you know, water does flow over land, so if you have a sloped lot that slopes down to an adjacent lot, you're not going to stop that. You cannot collect and concentrate a discharge where we would create uh, damage to the adjacent property. But they'll be required to connect uh, all of the, the gutters on the roof and the hardscape uh, and collect that to the stormwater uh, conveyance system. I just also wanted to tell you, I did not take that term as a watchdog, as a negative term at all. Every neighborhood likes to have somebody who keeps an eye on what's going on. So good. I hope we don't have to see from you again, but if you have another issue, come back and see us. All right. Well, thanks for listening to me. Sure. Okay. You got one more. Mm -hmm. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I also own property that, um, my name is Kate uh, Loyakano, and I'm here with my husband, Jeff. And then um, on behalf of a couple neighbors, unfortunately, we all couldn't be here today just due to the nature of like during the workday. Um, our property, Jeff and I's property, is on Cambridge. And so it's 12, the 12, the back lot there, essentially 12251 square foot. Mm -hmm. um, the home that's on the most um, there kind of is bordering that. And um, I think we just kind of have concerns about property values and the way that this is all structured. If you look at the homes in the neighborhood, they're all kind of a similar size, um, with a similar size lot. And by cutting this down, we're, we're cutting down the size of the lots. And then usually that would mean smaller homes. And I think that it has an effect on all of our property values, which is a concern to me being a <laughs> young Moscow citizen investing in a home. So um, that is, that's concerning to me. 
Also, what you really can't see from this picture is the road that's pro that they're proposing there come up Shelby. That is a pretty steep, significant drop off into that lower thing. I mean, I'm not a landscape engineer. I'm not a builder. So I'm sure there's ways to bring tons and tons of dirt in there to make it work. But when you're talking about access and all of bringing the city materials to the back, I don't it's, that's like a, a serious undertaking. This this property has major drainage issues. I feel for you talking into your home that you were speaking about because I can see how that would be happening. It's essentially a big hole that this is all going into. Um, so I think that's a concern when I see it as well. We've also heard that they're going to seek to go for multifamily next, which I realize is not part of this conversation here. But if they are planning next to try to change the zoning, then that, you know, I, I would like to just say it here. I know they have to come again, so I'll come again and argue that. Um, and then they, the property at the end of El Cajon that also is on Cambridge, you can see there that there's nothing developed, and that's also for sale. So there is an opportunity here to actually connect all the lots um, and, and perhaps go after something different as well. So there would be opportunity to join the back 12251 square foot with the larger property that's for sale off Cambridge. I have heard, but I have not been able to find if this is true or not, that at one point the people have access off Cambridge to that empty lot. They're asked for access off El Cajon, but were denied. So I, but I'm not sure if that's true and I haven't been able to see. But I think there's a lot going on here. My biggest concern is property value and what would happen um, I'm happy to have new neighbors build. I know that property is hard and it's find it hard space, but I don't see why there needs to be two lots. I think it really changes the face of the neighborhood um, and so forth. So I might have missed some pieces. I think Marie is. Um, yeah. yeah. If you want to speak, you can come up and send in her in the property. Just saying, I agree with this. Yeah. Her property is part of the easement there that we're talking about. Um, she's on Shelby there. So it's a access to that back property is really problematic if you're able to go look at it i don't know how someone could possibly get back there consistently and safely it's a steep steep hill that i don't know there's a little road there but it's certainly not 20 feet wide at the current state so so amy or bill do we have any issues there with respect to the width of that road or the drainage or the incline does it conform with what we need to it conform with thank you mm -hmm. um we, we don't have a design uh, that has been brought forward to the city for review. Um, I think it's, it certainly is feasible to, to construct an access way there, and it doesn't have to be 20 feet wide. The city code requires that there's 20 feet of property that abuts the public street, um, but driveways can be as, as narrow as 12 feet for construction underneath the fire code. So um, they would have room to do retainage if necessary uh, to grade a access drive in there. Uh, would not have to occupy the full 20 feet. And what, that's just a city code requirement for the lot frontage on a public street. And all storm drainage, as I mentioned before, will have to be collected and conveyed to the city stormwater system. This came up, so I wanted to ask you while you're at the podium. Can you talk to the ability to build multifamily in R1 or R2, which is the existing zone and the adjacent zone, if it was to be rezoned? Correct. R1 and R2 are both single-family only zoning districts, and that would not be approved to be rezoned for multifamily development. Yeah, so that would that's not possible there. Mm -hmm. If I may, two, the, the, I guess the shape of the lot split when you have different subdivisions come together, typically there is there are pieces of property that don't fit well. Mm -hmm. And typically we get people coming in saying, can I do a lot split? Is there some way I can make a buildable lot out of this? Uh, the R3 I, or R1, I believe, is 9,600 square feet minimum lot size. So both of these exceed that by quite mm -hmm. a bit. There wouldn't be another lot split allowed in either of these lots because then you'd be below the minimum lot size. So the size of the home really is up to the homeowner. As long as it is a single family dwelling and it meets the zoning requirements, it is up to whoever is building the home. Anyone else like to speak? Okay. Let's go back to this. Do you approve it? I still think it meets the legal requirements for a lot split and whether somebody you do wants- Do or don't believe it does? I do. Okay, I thought you said you and, didn't. Uh, but and whether or not uh, somebody can design a home that will occupy the lot and wants to deal with a definitely a steep driveway, that's up to them. But I don't see any 
legal foundation for denying the application. Yeah. yeah, I recommend approval as well. And I was just going to mention that just I can't I don't know the exact square footage of the other lots, but looking at it split, it actually looks like two more comparable lots to what surrounds it than one really large lot. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think that we should have I appreciate everybody coming and talking today, too. And I think this should go on the um, main agenda as opposed to consent, just because we've had quite a bit of discussion today. Great. So that means it will be on the agenda for August 2nd, potentially. There's a lot on the agenda that day, but... There's going to be a lot on the agenda. So we have three public hearings that day. Oh, so it will probably be on the subsequent one. Uh, we'll have to take a look at the calendar and yeah. see what we come but up with. But it will come back up, and so just watch the calendar and come back in and talk about it. But I do think that based on people's concerns that it should go to the full council. But thank you. Thank you all for coming. I think that wraps us up for the... Can we adjourn? No, we one are, more. Bob Bouvel is here. Oh, how did I miss? Talking that about us. Oh, that's, that one right there. Some Throw public utility extension. I didn't mean to knock you out there, buddy. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Bob Bouvel, and I am here to talk to you today about the South US 95 sewer water extension. Bob, can you pull the microphone closer to you? Yep. Is that, a bit, that better? Perfect, thank you. So just to give everybody an idea of where this, uh, where the project is gonna be, um, this, is, this is US 95 heading south out of town, and the project location is here circled in red. Just to kind of give you a, an overview of, of what uh, what we're planning on building here, this is uh, this is an aerial view of the of the area uh, that the project is going to be in. Uh, I've got a couple of colored lines there that show the green line would be where the new sanitary sewer is going to be would be built, and the blue line shows where the new uh, water lines would be built. And also overlaid on this photo is the uh, the proposed alignment of the new uh, the new highway project heading south out of town. Uh, and then a, a couple other overview items. Uh, this project would build um, about 1,950 feet of sanitary sewer and about 950 feet of new water main. Can I just ask you a question when you're in the middle of that? slide mm -hmm. just yeah go back one this thing that kind of looks like bushes and they kind of go down and then they go across kind of like a back bending l mm -hmm. um so what was that Can you identify what that was again uh so you're you're talking about in this yeah. area yes. here uh those are those are some existing trees that oh, were planted okay. along the uh that existing farmhouse okay. owned by the clyde family thank you Uh, just a little bit more background information. Um, extending utilities uh, south of the South Fork Palouse, South Fork of the Palouse River have been has been kind of uh, on the radar for a little bit, uh, for a little while, um, mostly for um, opening that area up to feasible development, the the creek crossing and the connection into the uh, into the lift station down there. Uh, it it kind of creates a little bit of a, a problem for, for development. Our lift station is currently right here. And so what that, what that does is that's a, a big tank that kind of collects sewage down in that, that south area of town and pumps it up the highway and into the, uh, to the intersection of Steiner and US 95. Uh, in 2018, the construction dates for the ITD Thorn Creek project uh, were were set, and so that kind of put us on the on notice that if we wanted to get sewer and water built out underneath that that highway project, that we needed to uh, needed to kind of get on that. And uh, the the project the project that we're planning would utilize the new the new and the existing US 95 uh, right away. So um, 
coordination between us and ITD was, was pretty important. And if we were able to get our utilities built prior to the ITD project, it would ultimately save us quite a bit of money in restoration cost and possibly uh, right away purchasing. And uh, I'm not sure if it was if it was COVID related, but the ITD project was then at some point got delayed an extra year, so we delayed our project an extra year. Um, Budgeting for for the the project is has a story to it as well. Uh, back in 2018, we did a preliminary planning level estimate of of how much it would cost in order to do this project, and that that estimate uh, calculated out to about three hundred and seventy thousand dollars. In 2020, um, the CIP program was updated for the new construction costs that we were seeing in 2020, and we increased the budget to $605,000. Uh, then in 2021, once we had the design finalized, plans ready to go, and we were getting ready to bid, we updated uh, the engineer's estimate with uh, up-to-date cost estimates and um, and some additional costs that that came up during the design process and i'm going to talk about those in a little bit too and so we increased the engineer's estimate to 874 almost 875,000. and in july we opened the bids uh in july we you know we put it out to bid and we opened the bids uh, those bids we got four of them and they ranged from 600 and roughly $680,000 or $680,000 to uh, $1,285,000. Uh, the initial apparent low bid was that, that $680,000, but it was it, after the bids were opened, we got contacted by the contractor. He said he had a math error in his, in his bid and ultimately he withdrew his bid. The next lowest bid was from ML Albright's at uh, $1,208,190. So pretty big difference. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, go into a little bit of the design and, and talk about some of those additional uh, costs that came up during the design project process. Uh, this is a, a clip out of our out of our sewer comp plan and when we when the comp plan was done they the consultant that we hired kind of looked at some of the, the buildable area along the fringes of the of the city and this is kind of the proposed layout that they put together for having a, a sewer line go out and, and service some of this area in that in in that area of town. And you can see that they've got that they've got a creek crossing up here at the north at the the lift station and a line kind of running down the highway with another line heading out into this into this area here. So when I went to do the design for this this project, I wanted to make sure that what I was building over here along the highway was going to be sufficient to serve this stretch out into here. And what I found when I when I laid a preliminary uh, profile out into this area was that if we wanted to serve that area with a gravity sewer line, we were going to have to be pretty deep in the along the highway here. And so um, I don't I don't know if you can kind of if you can really kind of see how these contours go, but if you see up here on Paradise Ridge and kind of follow that down you kind of see that there's a flat spot here and then the sewer line as a, the alignment of the sewer line goes and kind of drops down into a little bowl here and this bowl is is considerably lower than the ground that's up here but we if we want to serve that with gravity we have to lower this line here um, so obviously we we then kind of looked at is it is it 
appropriate to make the line deeper or should we just plan on a, another lift station to serve that lower area in the future and ultimately there's a there's a few things to consider um, the upfront cost of building that line deeper um, it w was something to consider I think it was it wound up costing us probably between about a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars more to build that deeper which uh, depending on the size of the lift station it is somewhat comparable but then if you look at the other aspects of having a, a lift station where you have uh, perpetual pump and motor maintenance perpetual power costs and you ultimately when you put in a lift station you wind up putting in two pipes you wind up putting the gravity line that goes into the lift station and then the pressure line that comes out so you have double the pipe that you have to maintain build and maintain as well and ultimately, we came to the conclusion that it was it would be in the best interest of of uh, uh, the sewer system to just build the line deeper now before the highway project comes in. Uh, another aspect of the line of the project that got more expensive was when we initially scoped out the project at the planning level. We were gonna uh, we were gonna extend the 12 inch main. Uh, down to the edge of the highway project uh, w the we came up with that 12 inch main based on the the comp plan that was done in 2012 uh, that uh, that comp plan that did uh, kind of did an analysis of the fire flows in in the area didn't highlight that that 12 inch main as a potential problem in the future and so initially we just planned on extending that same 12 inch main since that comp plan was done, our water model has been updated um, quite a bit with new information that we've been collecting, both uh, uh, like changes to the infrastructure that we've found where the old model had, uh, was, had pipes in it that we later found to be abandoned. And um, probably a big one was there's a, a line that runs down Main Street, kind of down through downtown that we thought was still active. And it turns out that that main is, has actually been abandoned. And so uh, all the flow that's kind of going south of town is going through one 12 inch main. So um, we updated the model. And then we also had to look at some new development that's coming into that south southeast quadrant, southwest quadrant of town. And uh, Along with all of, so with the new development and the changes to the to the model, we decided to start doing some modeling specific to that southeast quadrant of town, and the consultant came back with a with a recommendation that we increase this pipe to a minimum of 14 inches. 14 inches isn't a very common uh, pipe size, so uh, we ended up having to expand it all the way up to 16 inches, which is considerably more expensive than a 12 inch pipe. So now that we've kind of gone over how we, how we got to uh, a project that kind of that grew on us, we'll talk about the funding for it. Uh, the additional um, $501,000 that, uh, that the sewer capital fund is gonna have to uh, bear will come out of it'll come out of the capital uh, out of the main program the sorry sewer main program of the sewer capital fund and then the additional 102,000 would come out of the uh, 6.2 million water capital fund so we do do have the money to to cover it if we if we choose to to award this contract and so our recommendation is, is that we accept the low bid from ML Albright's for $1,208,190.40 or provide staff with further direction. And do we have any questions? If I could just provide uh, one clarification on the sewer fund funding. We have uh, just a little over $13 million in capital fund reserve in the sewer fund. Um, much of it we have been accumulating for the anticipated upcoming phase five uh, project out at the uh, water reuse and reclamation facility for the temperature standard. Uh, we are currently undergoing a facility study, um, and <clears throat> they're indicating that that project, which will likely 
uh, involve the installation of a chiller to reduce the temperature of our effluent is probably closer to that six to eight million, and we've been programming 12 million there. So the 1.8 million that Bob mentioned in the sewer fund is just in the sewer main program. We have kind of categorized out different uses of that reserve funding, so we have just about 13 million in total in capital fund reserve, so we do have a fairly hefty reserve. Um, the water fund is at 6.2 million. That is, uh, we also are sitting on approximately um, that 6.2 million is the total uh, water capital reserve that we have. Uh, but again, it's only 102,000 of additional funding that we need for that uh, side of the project. So I just want to clarify on the sewer fund that 1.8 was not the entirety of the sewer capital reserve. It's closer to just over 13 million. It's just under the sewer main program. Thank you, that was a good question. That was a question that we all had, at least I did. Um, any questions? Hi. Uh, yeah, first off, uh, very clever, Bob. You preempted my questions about the cost comparison between putting in a lift station and just going deeper. So good job on that one. Thank uh, you. Is groundwater going to be an issue going deeper? Are we going to get into a puddle down there and have to deal with that as uh, part of this? Water, water is going to be uh, is is going to be something we're going to have to fight with the with the construction um, in, in all sorts of ways. We have, we have to cross the uh, we have to cross the South Fork of the Palouse River. We've already applied for our 404 permit. We we have been approved for that. Um, the plan is if we do award the contract, uh, we would. That'll be one of the first things that we try to get done because we want to get that done during the end of August, early September, when flows are lowest, and and we're going to be battling that uh, the least. Even after we get out of that creek crossing area, that we're going to experience some groundwater. But in our uh, in our specifications, we kind of address that and the the cost of that dewatering uh, from groundwater is wrapped up in that in this price. So, okay. Yeah, other than the sheer sticker shock of it all, but yeah, which seems to be more common than not. But uh, yeah. so, do we know when ITD is planning to pull the trigger on their project? So the the most up to date uh, uh, update I've gotten is it, uh, that they're going to start next construction season. They're going to start at the at the north end and. Um, and then we'll start working their way south, and and so that it's anticipated that go. about two construction seasons from now we might. We, but that be would be the it. first part to go. So, yeah, it seems that it behooves us to do it now and not tear up the road twice. That was that was yeah. the the idea. It's going to be an expensive, a nice brand new expensive highway. We would not want to have to come back in afterwards and and. Uh, sorry, I misunderstood. Up. When did you say we'd start this project if it's approved? Uh, we we would start this project this construction this, season. This August. Uh, it, uh, it, we've got the the contract. The proposed end date for the contract that we have in in the packet has a, a completion date of mid November. I'd have to look back in there to get the the specific date, but mid November. Um, at this point, what I've been talking with ML Albright's about pipe prices and, and scheduling a little bit kind of ahead of, of this, and they're saying that they're not going to be able to get not going to be able to get pipe until maybe uh, October is what they were saying. So um, we're working on some some things we can do to try to get some pipe and get that creek crossing done still in in October, but it. Our goal is to get it done by the middle of November, but it may wind up extending further than that if we give them additional time because they weren't able to get the materials they need. So um, let me ask you another question, and that is with respect to groundwater, and then what are we doing with that groundwater? That becomes a question because water is such a big issue around here. So mm -hmm. do we have an idea of how we preserve the water that's kind of getting displaced? So when when we're talking about when we're if talking about groundwater, um, it's 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 enough water to um, to disturb the construction practices, but it's not an awful lot of water. It's not like the same amount of water that you would see flowing down it's like through Paradise Creek at the same time. So it's we would be we would be pumping the water out of the ditch, and we'd have to find appropriate places for it. A lot of times, you know, in an area like this, we'll find it, like a well vegetated area and just pump a little bit of that water into a vegetated area where it's allowed to dissipate solids, dirt, mud, 
kind of filters out before it enters any water body or anything and and that would be the way that we we would address it it's especially if we are able to do it in in august mid-september that water level drops quite a bit in those months and so theoretically we'd be dealing with even less less water but we it's a it, it's a small amount of water it's not uh not like bypassing a creek or anything so You've chosen a good year for dewatering the soils <laughs> yeah yeah So let me just ask you one other question. How long do those pipes last? There's issues if you're walking, if you're building those pipes through basic groundwater, uh, so that how long do they last before they can contaminate any kind of sewer water could contaminate any groundwater? Uh, so the, the PVC, the PVC piping, I, I honestly, I think it's the new, the new PVC piping. I think the jury's still kind of out uh, on how long it can last. Uh, the great thing about PVC is it's, it's really, uh, it doesn't corrode, so it doesn't rust, it doesn't react with soil chemistry, any of that stuff. The, the most common thing that breaks it down is uh, UV light and mm, being, being underground. It doesn't, 18, 16, and so it's, doesn't do it. uh, the new PVC pipe is, I don't, I'm not exactly sure off the top of my head, but it's a, probably a hundred years. Uh, any other questions? Can we go on the, on the consent or just go on the agenda? With regrets about the price, yes, put it on consent. Consent, I agree. Yeah, sure. I agree. Consent. Thank you very Thank much you. for your presentation you. and answering all our questions. Um, are there any reports from the staff? None. Okay, adjourn. All right. Okay, thank you very much.